Hi everyone, Dr. Kofi here and welcome to the Tutor Med channel where everything medicine is simplified. Today, we will continue our discussion on the other components of urine microscopy. In our previous video, we looked at the significance of red blood cells, white blood cells and epithelial cells in urine microscopy. The link to that video is in the description below. Kindly support this channel by liking and sharing this video and also subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can be updated on new video uploads. Alright everyone, let's begin. Now remember, in microscopy, we said to look for the three C's and one M. The first C is cells and it has been dealt with in our previous video. And so the second C is cas, and then we will look at what they are. What are they? They are precipitated proteins which are cylindrical in shape. They are cylindrical in shape because they take the shape of where they were produced, which are the renal tubules and specifically the thick ascending loop of Henle although some literature documents that they are produced from the distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting ducts. Their presence indicates renal origin. Now let's take a second to look at the basic architecture of casts. Every cast is composed of this cylindrical matrix called tamhosphal proteins, otherwise known as uromodulin. Apart from this protein, we have added materials embedded in this protein. Now, depending on the nature of this added material or component, we can have cellular casts or non-cellular casts. So a cellular cast means that the added component is cells. And then a non-cellular cast means that the added components are other substances other than cells. And so for cellular casts, if the cells embedded in the tamhosphal protein are red blood cells, then we have red blood cell casts. If they are white blood cells, we have white blood cell casts. If they are epithelial or tubular epithelial cells, then we have renal tubular casts and so on. And so let's begin with the first kind of casts the red cell cast. This basically means we have the tamhosphal protein mixed with red blood cells. Their presence indicates intraparenchymal or renal bleeding and they are a hallmark of proliferative glomerulonephritis which has numerous etiologies but to mention a few. Number one, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis which is basically a renal parenchymal disease induced by deposition of immune complexes into the kidneys following an infection with a group A beta hemolytic streptococcus now these immune complexes are basically a combination of an antibody and an antigen so this complex deposits into the kidneys and then induce an inflammation called glomerulonephritis and it is post-streptococcal. The next cause we have lupus nephritis and this is basically kidney involvement in a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus abbreviated as SLE. The next cause of proliferative glomerulonephritis, which can give you red cell casts, we have IgA nephropathy. And this is the deposition of IgA antibodies in the kidneys. And this deposition induces inflammation. It is important to note, however, that the red cell cast is highly insensitive, meaning a significant number of patients with proliferative glomerulonephritis will not have red cell casts in their urine during microscopy and so its absence 
should not or does not rule out proliferative glomerulonephritis. Another reason a patient can have rest or cast in his urine is acute interstitial nephritis. Again, we will look at this into details later, but basically, there is an inflammation in the kidney. Where in the kidney? It is not in the glomerulus, it is not in the tubules of the nephrons, but it is in the spaces between the tubules called the interstitium. And so the interstitium is inflamed. That is what acute interstitial nephritis stands for. Next, we look at the white cell casts. And understandably, this is made up of thumb hospital proteins and then white blood cells. Their presence suggests interstitial nephritis. However, only 3 out of 100 patients with biopsy proving acute interstitial nephritis have the white cell casts, only 3%. It can also be found in acute pyelonephritis and then less classically in glomerular inflammation or glomerulonephritis. And so we see that in acute interstitial nephritis, you may have red cell casts as said previously, or classically you may have white cell casts. Next, we have the renal tubular casts. And what is this cast made of? Yes, you guessed right. So it's made of the baseline tamhospital proteins and then the tubular cells, the tubular cells which line the renal tubules. And so these casts can be found in any condition in which there is disquamation of the tubular epithelium. So can you think of any? Yes, the first thing that comes to mind is acute tubular necrosis. So if you have acute tubular necrosis, which is one of the causes of intrinsic acute kidney injury you can have renal tubular casts in your urine then you can have acute interstitial nephritis again so you see that acute interstitial nephritis has or can have red cell casts white cell casts and even renal tubular casts however sometimes it may be seen in concentrated urine all right guys Please do not forget to like and share this video and then subscribe to our channel. Now the first three casts we've seen constitute the cellular casts, meaning time hospital proteins with cells embedded in them. Now let's turn our attention to the non-cellular casts and we will begin with the granular casts. And so, as usual, every cast is made up of a baseline tamhospital protein. But here, the added components are or is degenerated cells with some smaller plasma proteins. The clinical significance of granular cast is not very clear. However, coarse and deeply pigmented granular cast, usually described as muddy brown cast, can be found in acute tubular necrosis. But in general, granular casts do not have a clear clinical significance. The next non-cellular cast we want to look at is hyaline casts. And then these are the most common urine casts. It is a normal finding, or it is normal to find hyaline casts after a patient has undergone a strenuous exercise, the patient is dehydrated, the patient is stressed, or the patient is on diuretic therapy. It is very normal to find hyaline casts. However, pathologically, or it can be found in some disease conditions, including acute glomerulonephritis, chronic renal disease, and then pyelonephritis. Now, the next clinically significant type of cast we want to look at is the broadcast. And then this type of cast is associated with advanced chronic kidney disease. There are other types of casts we will not talk about here, but you have to be aware of them, like the waxy casts and then fatty casts. 
All right, folks. So we move to the third C, which is crystals. There can be a lot of crystals in the patient's urine. And particularly, you should be paying attention to crystals if you are suspecting that the patient has a stone in the urinary tract. So the crystals we can have in urine include calcium crystals, which could be calcium oxalates or calcium phosphate crystals. And you can have magnesium ammonium phosphate crystals, otherwise known as struvite stones or struvite crystals. Now, these crystals typically form in urine when the urine is alkaline. And one of the things that can make a urine alkaline is the presence of a urease producing micro, microorganism like Proteus mirabilis. And so if a patient has truvite crystals or magnesium ammonium phosphate crystals, you should be on the alert that this patient may have an infection which has made the urine alkaline. Then the next kind of crystal you should be looking for or which can be present is uric acid crystals. It also forms in acidic urine. You should be looking for that. Then we have cysteine crystals. And this is typical for patients who have cysteine urea and metabolic disease. We have other forms of crystals, but we decided to talk about these four crystals. All right, so folks, we said three C's and one M. We are done with the three C's. And so we move to the M, which is microorganisms. So bacterial contamination is very common when a sample is not collected under aseptic conditions. And so the presence of bacteria doesn't mean that there is bacterial infection, but it may be because the samples were not collected properly. The bacteria that can be seen include cocci, so it could be strep cocci or staph cocci, what we call streptococcus or staphylococcus. It could be bacilli. Now, aside bacterium or bacteria, we can have yeast in the urine. So most commonly, it's candida. And once candida is present, the microbiologist will describe its form, whether it is vegetative or it is pseudohyphae, or they are just perulated candida. The aside fungi or candidae or candida sorry you can have parasites like trichomonas vaginalis which is sexually transmitted and then schistosoma ova which can help in the diagnosis of urinary schistosomiasis 